Hi everyone, my name is Matt Miller. I'm an occasional instructor at the Acting Studio Chicago. This week we are talking about the recurring role on television. It's an interesting one in that it's a couple steps up from the co-star level role, but not quite the same status as a series regular role. And that makes it interesting and, and tricky territory for actors, especially when you're on set. Uh, so I brought a guest in today to talk about that, someone that you might recognize from uh, most recently his uh, recurring role on the Fox hit show Empire, where he played uh, the role of Leonard Bernstein for 12 episodes over the course of three seasons, including the season finale. Uh, very happy to be chatting with Will Kinnear today. Will, how are you? I'm well. It's good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, Will splits time between Los Angeles and New York these days, but he spent a considerable amount of time in Chicago once upon a time and uh, is actually an alum of the Acting Studio Chicago. Um, tell us about that. Um, yes, that is absolutely all true. I was in Chicago for a great many years doing a lot of theater um, at a to, you know, too many venues to mention, but yes, I started taking classes at the Actors Studio um, back in 2005. That was the first time I ever stepped in front of a camera. Um, so my introduction to on-camera work happened at the Actors Studio. Um, Chris Stolte was my first instructor. I took a few classes with Chris. Uh, I took several classes with you, yours truly. Um, I know that I was in a class with Rachel Patterson. I did a master's class with Rachel there. We had a different instructor every week. Um, and I also did uh, Stephen Cohn's Cinema Lab, which was hosted at the Actor Studio of Chicago. So a number of classes. Truly an alumni then, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you can join us today and, and talk a little bit about your experience on Empire uh, in particular. Um, like I said, you played the role of Leonard Bernstein for, for uh, over the course of three seasons. Um, three seasons. Yeah, so. and I'd love to know just how did that start? What was the first audition like? Um, what were you called in for? Did you have any inkling that this was going to be a bigger role? Uh, tell us about the beginning. Well, the last part of your question, did I have any inkling? The answer is absolutely no. Um, uh, I have to say that it, to answer this, it, it's important to, the little backstory that is that is interesting that is, that is needed is that I started acting in 2003 as an adult um, at the age of 45. Um, I had been a very serious theater actor as a kid and then I played music, plays, which I consider to be performing, but I didn't start acting again as an adult until I was 45 years old. So my, my story is not necessarily uh, or my story is probably a little bit unique. However, I started auditioning for on-camera work in 2005 and did not book um, anything into 2015, which was Empire. I would not wish that on anybody. Um, however, that was my story. What's important for our discussion is to note that from 2005 to 2015, I did nonstop theater. I did every show that I could get my hands on and I did every class I could get my hands on both scene study and of course, as we mentioned, a ton of on-camera um, classes and on at the Actors Studio. And I think that was really important um, to sustain me during all those years and to prepare me for that moment when I walked into Claire Simons in the summer of 2015 um, for this audition. No, there was no inkling that it would be more than what it appeared on the page, which was one line, co-star, I did have a name, which every actor knows is, is exciting. Um, and I went into that audition. I was working on a play at the time at Steep Theater. Um, I appeared at Claire Simon's door, turned around and saw a friend who was in the play that I currently was doing. And we both looked at each other and we were dressed exactly alike. It was a little bit like picking up a prom date and finding a guy already at the door. <laughs> holding a similar corsage. <laughs> uh, when we walked into the waiting room, there were 30 other guys exactly, dressed exactly alike. That's something you don't think about, I think, when you're preparing to audition, is the fact that you, you're gonna run into friends, and you're, especially in Chicago, in this market, um, who are also competing for the same role. And it's, it is a, a tricky energy to navigate that waiting room 
when you're looking at your competition and many of those people are people you know to be wonderful and good actors. Absolutely. And I, and I just to briefly touch on that, and, and I think everybody has their own strategy. I mean, it's like my philosophy is that I'm not competing with those 30 other actors. I'm there to do a job. I'm there to show the director, the casting people, this is how I would solve your problem, which is something I learned from, from you. That was, that's phraseology I learned from you. This, I am here, here's a solution to your problem. This is how I would do this part. I don't think of it as a horse race. And I think that helps preserve your, your sanity and it helps you not get stressed out about the 30 other guys in the room yeah. that are just exactly like you. Um, but I will say this, and as far as the, the, the waiting room is concerned, just a little bit, I, I personally handle commercial auditions and TV film auditions differently. For commercials, I'm happy to be chatty and joking around and, and being social. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, I find it relaxing, and I think for commercials, that's a good vibe to take in. For TV and film, I stay very focused. I stay on my own, and I don't generally talk to anybody. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, so, it, Walking in, you know, bringing in specifically to this audition experience for Empire, yeah. you, you're heading into the session, into the room, and this is a director session. So you are, right. you are going in um, for the first round and you're meeting the director, which is not super unusual, but it, doesn't, it definitely raises the stakes on, on that audition experience. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's still done this way, but at that time, um, I know it was the same way when I auditioned for Claire for Chicago Fire and I booked that. Empire was this way, was that these, these types of roles were booked from that director session. There would be no callback. Go in the room and in this case, there was Danny Strong who was with Lee, uh, Lee Daniels, the co-creator of the show, and he would be directing this episode. And Claire and I think some other producing producers of Empire were in the room, I'm not sure. Um, it could be a little daunting. I think you need to be prepared for that. It's a little different than some other auditions where you're just going in and a casting associate will be there with a mm -hmm. with a camera and that's it. So um, you need to be a little bit prepared for that. But in this case, uh, yeah, I went in and I had one line and I went in as I recommend with a strong choice. Um, I happened to be playing a board member and I was advising uh, Terrence Howard's character uh, that uh, Lucius Lyon that I thought was a bad idea to be expanding his business while he was being investigated by the SEC. I mean, the line might as well have been that. <laughs> it was something to that effect. Yeah. And I had a, a strong choice that I was sort of a nebbishy, Woody Allen-ish version of this, like Mr. Lyon, I, I think this is a bad idea, you know? And, uh, Danny said, I love that. Now take the air out of it. You know more about this than he does. You have the status in this room, go. And I just said it simply. I just said it straight through. I crossed my legs, sat back, folded my hands. Um, and he gave me two thumbs up. And after 10 minutes of not booking anything, you know, Jess Jones called me, you know, before I got to my car and actually said, you're on check avail, <laughs> <laughs> which, didn't mean much to me, but the next morning, yeah, I found out I, I had booked it. Um, That's fantastic. I think it's important to note for your students that it can start to feel like these auditions are, are pointless or that they will never be fruitful. Um, but I think you have to think of it as you're doing this, this is what you do, this is the job. You cannot focus on the result doing the audition is the thing itself until you book the room. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but no, I think does. you can't white knuckle the, the, the result of it or you will drive yourself crazy and you won't do your best work. And I think after that much time, and I would like to think that none of your students will take that long, um, I had gotten to that point. This was just another audition mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted it, but I certainly didn't get wrapped up in desperately you know, needing it. Or, yeah, it's amazing. Thing, it's amazing what the universe gives you when you're not desperately grabbing at it. When you are relaxed and you know open and, and ready to accept what is what is coming through that channel to you. I absolutely believe that's true about this business and 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 others as well. I say this to young actors all the time: do this because you absolutely love it, 
Just do it every day and good things will happen, but you cannot be white knuckling the outcome. Mm -hmm. So you book the role and you go to set. Um, yes. Tell me about your shoot experience on that, that set for the first time. What was the vibe? Um, you know, we can talk about how you prepared, but I'm, I'm more interested in knowing kind of how that, how that first experience went overall. Well, the first thing I would say is uh, I made the double mistake both for the audition and going on set in that I had never watched the show. Ah. Don't do that. <laughs> um, I have subsequently learned um, that it is important to understand the world that you are about to walk into. Uh, I have a teacher in LA who talks a lot about understanding genre. Mm -hmm. Is it a half hour comedy? Is it a single camera comedy? Is it a multi-camera comedy? Is it an hour long drama? Um, understanding that world you're walking into will help you in the audition. And it is very necessary when you go to shoot. So I walked on that set knowing precious little about that show, which I think was a big mistake. And luckily my, I had my antennae up and I was paying attention and I was listening and I picked up on what the vibe of the show was um, in terms of how people were playing stuff. And one of the things I noticed was that everything was very underplayed, um, a lot of lines being thrown away and that the series regulars were all paying, um, we're all very improvisational. <laughs> mm. And uh, I think that was great. I think some of that's because they just got so much text every day, working 10 hours a day, there was no way they were gonna memorize word for word. So I would say, be prepared for your series regular scene partners to be improvising, but you as the co-star need to be word perfect. Yeah, good advice. And I mean, yes, my first day I only had one line, it wasn't difficult, but as things went on, um, that was a rule that I, that I adhered to. So yeah, the vibe was, I was nervous. I think you've just got to accept that you're going to be nervous. It's a little bit out of body. I did not know until the night before that I would be sitting across from Marissa Tomei. Mm -hmm. I knew that Henry Tower would be in the scene. And anybody that has worked will know that you get led by a PA from the, from the, from the, down a long hallway and then on and on through a maze until all of a sudden you come into the light and there you will, might see Terrence Howard and Marissa Tomei chatting. <laughs> and uh, it's natural to have a little bit of an out-of-body experience. I think that the way you deal with that, everybody deals with it differently, is to take a deep breath and say, this is what you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot, this is no time to focus on that whatsoever. I think you've got so much, you've got such a big job to do that the, that it's not so difficult to ignore that fact and allow yourself a moment of being a little out of body, but that will go away. If it doesn't go away and you melt into a puddle, you probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> fair, fair. But that's how, uh, I, I, I walked in, sat down. Gratefully, there was a rehearsal. Um, Danny Strong was very supportive because I, Terrence was improvising and he was, he was my line, you know, he was done. So there was this long pause, you know, and I was, I felt terrible about it. And Danny came up and patted me on the back and said, no problems. You know, when he stops talking, you start talking, don't worry about it. Um, so that's how I handled it. And then very briefly, uh, after we broke for lunch, Terrence Howard, uh, being one of the nicest and most generous and kindest people I've ever met came up he introduced to me, told me I was doing a great job. And did I know where the food was? And he walked me to the, and that made a, a huge impression on me and relaxed me uh, more than I can say. Um, and then anybody should be so lucky as to have that, have one of yeah. the stars be that kind. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, wonderful. So you, you had this initial shoot day, one line, one yep. big scene. Um, how, how, do you, how did the next step happen then uh, for Leonard to become recurring? Um, what, what was that journey from this, this shoot experience to being invited back? Um, it was a little bit circuitous and certainly unexpected. Um, one always hopes that you will be asked back. I certainly didn't have any logical reason to thinking I would be asked back, um, but I got a call from my agent a couple of weeks later um, saying, 
they would like you to audition for the role of board member. <laughs> Isn't that the role you just played? Yeah. And I said, Jess, <laughs> calling me calling me crazy here, but I think that's what I just played. And she goes, I know it's a little confusing, but they would like to take a board member that's already established and increases visibility. Mm -hmm. I said, great. I'm learning like all the time now. This is that makes a, that makes little sense, but okay, I'll do that. So I went in for another audition and was given the line, I second it. <laughs> and the showrunner and director of this ep uh, the showrunner and the then showrunner and the director of this episode, a, a lovely person named Santa Henry was in the director session again. I said, I second it, believe it or not, she gave me a note. <laughs> and uh, probably to throw it away a little more um, and said, great. And before I got to my car, Jess called me and said, they want you to come back tomorrow. They'd like to see you in the role of a board member with a higher profile. So I went back the next day and I did have a much bigger part to audition for. It was several speeches. I was playing a board member who was Marissa Tomei's right-hand man of sorts mm -hmm. and we were managing a board meeting wherein Terrence's character Lucius Lyon was kicked out of kicked out of his job um, had several speeches was spent the whole day with Marissa Tomei etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what the part they asked me to come in and do um, that was two days of shooting it was a wonderful experience um, getting to work with Marissa Tomei um, Naomi Campbell um, Taraji, et cetera, et cetera. So then I'm of course hoping that I'll come back. What I don't know behind the scenes is that there was another scene that they were preparing for wherein a board member, two board members suggest to Terrence and Taraji that they become co-CEOs. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know was that casting had decided they would go find some other people to be board members to do that. But the showrunner, Santa Henry said, why are we getting new people we already have um, the wonderful Sarah Savini, who was playing a very high profile board member at the time. Um, and myself, why, why would you do that? We've already established Will, let's make him chairman of the board. And Sarah is a high profile board member, let's let them do it. So again, these are the machinations behind the scenes that you can't predict when you're, when you're yeah. offered a one million role, you don't know this is gonna happen. One of the reasons, who knows, that Santa said, why don't we just use Will? I'd like to think is because I had been serious and prepared and, and stayed in my lane and been a, 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 you know, a good actor and a, and a good employee in the previous times that I had been on set. That, that's and tremendous. And I, and I think that really leads into my next question. And I think the yeah. heart of what it means to be a recurring actor on a show and that is the, the navigation of onset relationships that you now get to have <laughs> as a recurring actor. You're not just there for one day. And so now you're developing yeah. relationships with the cast and with the crew. And as you've already kind of mentioned, those became very valuable in terms of this, in terms of this role growing and becoming more than just a, a one-off character. Um, but, but, you know, there's, there's pitfalls, there's traps. You can't get too chummy. You can't get too presumptuous, or you know that that can also backfire on you. Um, tell us more about your experience, and, and more specifically, what your strategy was for being on set as a, a recurring character. Um, can can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. I, I think that when I say that Santa said, "Why don't we just use Will?" I, I'd like to think that the reason, one of the reasons she did that, and I think. I know that I've heard this from you. When you walk into an audition and when you walk onto set, I think one of the most important things is you want the people in power, the director, the crew, the showrunners to all say, this is a guy I want to spend 16 hours with. Mm -hmm. this is somebody that I want to work with. And I think we're all good actors. There's a lot of us that are good actors. We're not all that person that you want to spend 16 hours with. So I think my strategy to the extent that I had one was the same as I had as an actor in all those shows I've done is I wanna be somebody that is easy to work with, follows instructions. Um, in this particular case, because there are stars in, involved, 
keep a low profile. And as I think we've, we talked uh, before, I, I think this is really important is that a lot of actors, um, certainly in my circle uh, that I, and I, and I make no judgment about this because I understand it, get into this situation, get onto a set in a co-star role. And there is a trap that you can fall into wherein you feel a little bit like a tourist who's won a day at Disneyland. Yeah. And suddenly you want to take selfies with the star because you never know if you're going to have this chance again. Yeah. And I, it may be my ego. <laughs> I don't know. I approach this as I want to be like these guys who are working every day. I want, this is a job. I am here to do a job. I am not a tourist. I'm not here to take selfies. I'm here to do a job. And you know, to the extent that I had a strategy, that was my strategy is I was serious. I never took a selfie with anybody. Um, I never took pictures of anything. And I think that's important. I think you want to think of it as a job and you're not a tourist and you need to do that job. You need to be prepared. You need to break down the text you would for a play that you're in or for a class that you're doing. It's really no different. Um, so you that really is my strategy. Yeah, and actually you told me a great little anecdote that I wanted to see if you would share of, of you know, being on set and, and you had your, your script and your scene kind of all carved and marked up in terms of your, your beats and your objectives and your actions. And, and Terrence saw it. And I, I wonder if you could tell us what, what that encounter was like. Well, I just briefly say that Terrence Howard is just a, a, a terrific, he was a terrific guy to me from the very beginning, as I mentioned. And I, and I will say that um, Terrence and I got into the habit uh, it was a, something he initiated was that when we would wrap a scene, he would challenge me to a push-up contest. <laughs> and, and I would just like to say that Terrence Howard can do something like 70 push-ups and I did a, about seven. So <laughs> this was a contest that I never won, but um, we were sitting between, between when they were doing, changing the setups and yeah, I am a bit of a, to a fault, a bit of a fastidious, over-prepared actor. And I do take my script and mark it up and, 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 and of all kinds of notes and whatnot. And he was standing there looking over my shoulder and he asked something to the effect of, why are you doing that? <laughs> or, you know, why do you, why do you have to do that? Why are you doing that? And I said, Terrence, you're number one on the call sheet. I'm number 64. I said, when I'm number one on the call sheet, maybe I won't have to do this. Until then, I have to do this. And he allowed us how he, uh, he, he understood that. Yeah. But you have to be prepared. And I think that kind of goes to just the, the mindset of being yeah. a professional, being prepared, doing your homework, being ready to zig when, you know, the, the star in your scene zags. And Absolutely. In many ways, um, you have to be you have to be more prepared than they are because they have a great deal of uh, a great deal of of room is given to them to do what they want and mm -hmm. you are not given that. Um, I will say you know the great some of your students will know who he is Andre Royo of The Wire Bubbles of The Wire was somebody that I became very friendly with on the show and um, he would tease me for the same reason and you know he was number three on the call sheet and I pretty much said the same thing to him. Yeah, you have to be more prepared than the stars are. It's almost, you know, you've got a, you're a job and you're in a cubicle. They're on the upper floors, you're in a cubicle. You've got to, you've got to work harder in some ways. Um, and I think, again, that feeds back into, you know, why did I get asked back? Why did I get, make it for three seasons? I think that was a part of it. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and the relationships that formed very organically with people like Terrence and Andre are another reason. And that kind of brings in another question. I mean, we've touched on it a bit already, but one of the challenging aspects of, and one of the exciting aspects of being a recurring character on a show like Empire is that most of your scenes are with the stars. You are in the scenes with the series regulars. And, you know, I just look at the short list of people that you shared screen time with, uh, Taraji Henson, Terrence Howard, Forrest Whitaker, Marissa Tomei, Gabby Sidibe, I know there's several more that I'm missing. Yeah, Andre Royo, which should not be overlooked, is a wonderful. Uh -huh. and, and I mean, what did you learn from being in scenes with those kind of actors? What, um, what did you take away from 
um, being able to play with actors of the, that caliber? I mean, very selfishly, and it's a thrill. Um, it's thrilling, however, you, you, you can't allow yourself to really savor it until you're done shooting. I think an amazing thing happens ideally in that when you are working that they literally become, and it sounds a tad cliche, they literally become just actors. Yeah. Um, you're standing there with Forrest Whitaker and I don't know how many Academy Awards he's won or been nominated for, but at the end of the day, he's an actor. Um, and if you've done a lot of plays and you, whatnot, you've worked with a lot of very good actors. He's a very, very good actor who's had a great deal of success. Having said that, I think that one can learn a great deal um, in how each of those people do their thing. Terrence was very improvisational and relaxed and loose. Mm -hmm. Forrest, I don't think you would mind me revealing, was an ex extremely fastidious actor. Um, I remember one night we were working until two in the morning, which is common on, on Empire, and Forrest had a pretty big speech. And while everybody else was talking and chatting and being social, Forrest was over there pacing back and forth with the script, running it, just running it and running it and running it. And the guy was very, very serious about what he did. And I think you can pick up something from everybody at that level and say, yeah, I want to be like that. In the same way that Terrence seemed to have the confidence to be very loose and improvisational, um, I think you can take that in. And you look at Forrest doing his thing the way he is, I think you need to take that in. Um, but it is a thrill. And I, and I know I mentioned it to you anecdotally. I had one night um, where Jesse Smollett um, was directing for the first time. And we were doing a scene that, was, that had Taraji and Terrence and Forrest in it. And and actually, I'm gonna show that scene. So cut right here. Here comes the scene, boom. This is Eddie's doing. There's always an excuse. How could you allow this to happen? You assured us that everything in this event would go off without a hitch. Always an excuse. Who do you think you're talking to? Y'all need to calm down. And you think I meant for that to happen over there? Look, Blake is history for now. I'm gonna talk to him and work this thing out, but the rest of this glorious night can go on without a hitch. All we have to do is get the rest of our artists to distract the press and we can get through the rest of this opening. You're not gonna use this artist. Excuse me. I can't afford to get caught up in all of this mess. Word is out that Empire is making bank off of a racist artist. Listen, little lady, I don't know what kind of big ideas Eddie's been filling up in your little bitty head, but ain't nobody here that's not replaceable. Well, you can't replace us all, Lucius. <laughs> your artists are united, and we're not performing until y'all fix this. Can I help? Help you did this. You know, I'm sure you got it all under control. Eddie, please don't go. In my opinion... We don't want your opinion. Actually, Cookie, we do. So we just saw the clip of that scene. Right, and you're going to see, like, if what you've just seen is whatever that is, 15 seconds of screen time that probably took about three hours to shoot. Um, there's a lot of people on that scene. Now, there's rumor Willis is in that scene. Um, She's just got one little bit of coverage and eye roll that I think is one of my favorite moments of the scene. But in that scene, I confront Lucius about another one of many screw ups that, you know, has sort of pushed my character to the, to the limit. And I, I had some line that confronted him, but right before we shot it uh, the first time, Jesse pulled me aside and changed the line. Um, to something that was a little more aggressive. And I can't remember, but you've seen the clip, you'll see what yeah. it is. Something that was more aggressive that Terrence wasn't expecting because he knows that I'm always word perfect. Sure. So he thinks he knows what I'm gonna say. <laughs> and he says, this is really gonna piss Terrence off. And I love uh, director secrets, actor secrets. So sure enough, we shot it. This is a true story and it's a little bit of name dropping, star dropping, whatever, but it was a great moment for me. We shot it and Terrence just about, his eyes just got <laughs> big. And he was really angry, almost as though Will had said this to Terrence, you know? And I could see it worked. He was angry and really came at me. Uh, and I'm not sure if that ended up in the, what they finally cut. And afterwards he came up and he hugged me and he said, I hate, I hate talking to you like that. <laughs> I hate getting mad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's, yeah. 
it was just a great moment. And I think in the end of the scene, you'll see Forrest Whitaker walks in and says, well, I can see I'm needed and I'm not needed. And I said, Eddie, don't go. And Taraji says something. And I said, Taraji, enough, for me. whatever I said, Taraji, whatever. And that night I'm walking back to my trailer and I'm just thinking, you know, you've been doing this a little while, but you were just there in a little triad with Terrence Howard, or whatever, yeah. with Terrence Howard and Forrest Whitaker and um, Taraji. And I think it's important to savor that because as actors, we're always thinking, what's the next thing? What's the ne how, where are we gonna go from here? Where are we gonna go from there? Who knows, at that moment I said, I may never do anything that, that good with actors of that stature and I, and I really let myself enjoy it. I really let myself enjoy it. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I do think it is important to smell those roses when, uh, when, they, when they appear. Right. Um, don't I have one more little clip I want to share that I love that <laughs> is between a board meeting with you and Terrence, and I'm going to play it now. Yes. Clearly, in light of this, Andre will have to step down and resign from the board. Really? Because according to those leaked emails, Vernon was the only person around here who paid for sex. Frequently. You mean Papa Bernstein? Uh, that's exactly what I mean, Pop. And I've seen some emails that put your. And uh, so I, I, I love the Papa Bernstein uh, <laughs> little quip that Terrence has. And that does feel improvisational. Can you tell me about that moment? I can. I mean, there's two things. There's a couple of things about that scene. One thing is that I'm very disappointed that uh, this particular part of my character didn't get fo more fully developed. That <laughs> was uh, somewhere, I, you're probably not showing it, I did a scene outside with Trey Bri Briers, uh, Byers, Trey Byers, who played one of the sons, Andre, a wonderful guy as well. And in that scene, he had a young woman that was a part-time exotic dancer and she wanted to be a singer and he wants to steal my cell phone. So he has her trip into me. And, you know, I'm part, I'm distracted because she's this beautiful woman and whatnot. And sure enough, she steals my cell phone. All of that was cut. It's unfortunate because I would love to have had an entire pl plot line where I was the, some sort of oversexed board member. <laughs> sadly, that, sadly, that didn't happen. But no, in that moment, um, Two things happened. I think the Papa Bernstein line I know was improvised. And as I mentioned to you, I feel like that came out of Terrence's and my friendly rapport. Mm -hmm. I think that we played around a lot. I mean, there's another scene we did where we were on stage where Terrence grabbed the microphone from me. We're at a big gala and he was behind me. And between shots, he grabbed the microphone and said, I don't understand why is, is Will the chairman? I thought I was the chairman and had to be explained to him that he was CEO and that I was actually his boss. And, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I think the moment, the Papa Bernstein moment, came out of that rapport, which feeds back into showing up to do your job and and follow yeah. the lead of the stars, and not take selfies and all of that stuff. Fed into a you know which what what was a fun moment and ends up being a fun moment on 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 screen. It was it was a difficult moment. I mean from your students will appreciate because what happens is I'm accused of paying for sex using company funds. And since everything else in the show was underplayed, you know, when they're all looking at me, I, I underplayed my, my embarrassment. And Santa came up to me and whispered in my ear and I said, she said, I need you to be really embarrassed. Oh, wow. And yeah, for your students, I think um, I have subsequently done a lot of work on this kind of thing, um, meaning I thought at that time I had had a lot of training and I knew how to do something under pressure. It's a lot of pressure. You got a lot of people standing around and they're not getting what they want from you. Um, and it's hard getting a result oriented note like that too, where it's, it's, it's you know, essentially bigger, <laughs> more well, bigger. I was being asked and God bless Santa, she's incredibly, she, she just needed to get it done. Um, you know, as an, as an actor, a theater actor and all of this stuff, you know, playing an emotion is tough. Um, it's one moment that I regret because I think I resorted to an indication. I, you know, I kind of mm -hmm. indicated it. Um, I think that's only significant in that uh, sometimes you're under pressure. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you're asked to do something and you don't have time. It's not like theater where you have a lot of rehearsal time to figure it out. I think it looks a lot better than it felt. I think it ended up working out. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. That little clip, I think, is effective. 
Um, yeah. But certainly, I can I can understand uh, how difficult that is when you get a note. Um, That's what happens. And on TV, it's guess what? We got to move on here. I need you to do, and that goes back to why you need to be prepared. I think what I'm saying is, in that moment, I I had thought a lot about it, and I thought that what I had in mind something very subtle was gonna work. But guess what? Sometimes they come back at you and say, no, we need something else. And yep. that's where being as prepared as possible um, pays off. That's fantastic. Um, well, heading into the, the home stretch here and, and wrapping up, any general advice for actors? I mean, you've, you've dispensed quite a lot of, of, I think, really helpful wisdom here from this experience on Empire, but you know, anything in particular that you wanted to share as a, a final thought? Um, you know, it might, I talked a lot about my philosophy in terms of, of you, you've got to really love this and you've got to really love the process. You've got to love taking classes and love doing auditions. And if you don't, you probably um, shouldn't be doing this. I do think, and it's not something that I do all the time, but I have a teacher out in LA that stresses this. And I'm sure you would agree is that if this is what you want to do for a living, you need to be doing something every day that is. Um, to be acting, to be doing this. Uh, I think in this day and age of having the kind of cameras we have on our iPhones is that there is no reason to not be shooting a film on the weekends with your friends or shooting a scene that you've written mm -hmm. and to keep taking classes. Um, I, there's no reason. I certainly haven't had huge success. Why would I say even I take classes? No, <laughs> believe me, I keep taking classes. Partly because I think it's the community that sustains us. That might be a great lesson. Um, yeah. Is that I think it is the community that sustains us that makes us want it possible to keep doing this. Um, and that's one reason to why to do plays, do classes, um, until you get the opportunity to be on a TV show and, and take the next step. So stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great final thought. That's a great that's final thought. Uh, Will, thank you so much for making time today. I so appreciate it. And uh, if if people want to check out Empire, I think they can find it online. And uh, those scenes with Leonard Bernstein are real. Sure. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Thanks. Always fun.